all of the data that we were just talking about in terms of infrastructure crises, in terms of personal crises, that's all generally collected from Indigenous people who live on reserve. Okay? Um, however, more than 50% of Canada's Indigenous population does not live on reserve. It lives in Canada's cities, very similar to the rest of the Canadian population, right? The vast majority of Canadians live in its 10 largest cities. It's not at all as though um, everyone is sort of evenly distributed. This is a particular concern, though, when we talk about um, Indigenous people because of the way that the federal government administers its policies and sort of works through this. So if you read comments about stories about Indigenous people in the news, I would not recommend doing this, but if you do, you'll it won't take you very long to run across sort of stereotypes of Indigenous people in cities experiencing homelessness, experiencing poverty, experiencing addictions. And it's not that those things aren't real, it's that, generally speaking, the comments sections will blame individuals for that. And there are a lot of sort of structural challenges that we're sort of going to talk about a little bit. Um, this represents a really serious problem because the model that the federal government uses to respond to challenges and issues in Indigenous communities tends very much to be based around the idea of reserve communities and bands, which means that there's a lot of ways to sort of create projects and fix things on reserve, but there's very little sort of clear sense as to what responsibilities the federal government has to Indigenous populations who do not live on reserve. And that's, again, part of the sort of idea about assimilation in this conversation, because the assumption sort of was that if you were going to move to the city, that you were going to become westernized, colonized, whatever you want to sort of talk about that as being. And at that point, you wouldn't need the federal government services. Um, and so that comes to be a bit of a, a challenge um, because of the, the issue, just because of that sort of question about, hey, what do you do with people who remain connected to our community but live in the city because of what they do, right? So if you are, for example, an Indigenous elder and you have been offered um, a position to work at a university, for example, um, you, they want you to be one of the elders on staff at McEwen at the university, and we have some right? That's a real job that you can have. Um, do you really want to be driving in four hours every day from your home community? Or are you going to have a place in the city? And if you have a place in the city, then how do you access your treaty rights when you're not on your sort of reserve land? Um, and the federal government doesn't really have a particularly compelling answer to that question. Um, I will sort of say that there are challenges even at that sort of band and reserve level. So it's possible to get grants for particular projects um, in Indigenous communities, even in the city, i.e. building rec centers, that kind of thing. Um, but when we talk about it at band and reserve levels, it's often um, not a lot of things um, that are sort of, there's a standardization that doesn't really account for um, how you shift that and sort of for context. Um, an example of this might be to sort of talk about the function of hockey rinks. Um, so hockey rinks or ice skating rinks, whatever you want to call them, and however you conceptualize them, vary quite a lot across the country. So for example, in the Yukon, many of the community hockey rinks were built to also serve community garden functions, i.e. they contribute to food security, people use the roof and solar panels and all kinds of things to be able to grow food, connected to the fact that food in the territories can be really, really expensive. Um, and that's a necessary thing to do. It makes them more expensive to build initially, but it also provides an additional function in sort of the community. Um, and if you don't account for context, then you don't understand why building a hockey rink in the Yukon is much more expensive than building the same, the same size hockey rink in Saskatchewan. So there's that kind of challenge. Um, and then there's also sort of contextual issues when we talk about this kind of issue in terms of it's much more expensive if you want to build anything near Fort St. James because you have to get in 
people and materials and all of that sort of stuff than if you want to build near Mascochis, um, which for those of you who grew up in Edmonton is the current name for what you may have heard referred to as Huguima. Um, so th j there's a question about proximity and where the reserve is in relation to the largest communities. There's all of those sorts of questions. So the federal government has a lot of very complicated questions and for that reason, they've sort of just stepped aside and refused to deal with the question of what you do with indigenous people in, in, in sort of urban communities and in urban centers. The provinces have started to step in to address this uh, sort of from a practical, I guess, public order standpoint. Um, so we're talking about the inclusion, things like the inclusion of indigenous content in curriculum designs. Um, so this is the development of courses in Aboriginal studies, which exist in Alberta at the 10, 20, 30 level. Um, requirements for Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous understanding in teacher training. So if you want to graduate as a teacher in Saskatchewan, for example, you need to have at least three credits at the university level in, in, in an Indigenous language. You have to take a semester of Cree, you have to take a semester of Dene, whatever that sort of is. Um, this is also sort of spaces where we talk about having elders and schools, i.e. a McEwen or an any number of high schools and that sort of stuff, to address those sort of cultural issues and to provide those services. Um, also things like training healthcare, center, healthcare staff, so in terms of cultural sensitivity, this is conversations about why, about how sweet grass braids are really important in um, Indigenous communities and so you probably shouldn't remove them from bath and babies in the nursery, that kind of thing. That's really, really important. Um, again, the inclusion of elders in that sort of space in the same way that you would include like chaplains, you can include elders to sort of meet all of those pieces. Um, provinces are also sort of doing things around sort of restorative justice. So for those of you who have ever sort of looked at um, restorative justice or sentencing circles or that kind of thing, um, this is an attempt to incorporate Indigenous principles and Indigenous communities and sort of the justice aspect of that, um, community sentencing and that kind of thing. So it's not that no one is attempting to address the concerns of, of urban Indigenous people. It's that by and large, this is the provincial and municipal governments stepping up and saying, well, we got to do something. Okay, we have to do something because these are people who live here and they deserve services and we're sort of responsible for providing them and we're trying to give them what is going to be relevant to them. But there's definitely a jurisdiction challenge here because there are there is an argument to be made from, for example, a provincial government to say, um, excuse me, Ottawa, right now, uh, Alberta, whichever province you want to talk about, is paying a $14,000 per student grant for, I don't know, 15,000 students whose parents are sort of status indigenous. So why aren't you paying us that back? Because Indian education, which is what it's referred to under the Indian Act, um, is a federal responsibility. We shouldn't be responsible for paying that. Um, and so there's this sort of tension between what provinces are doing and what the law tells them they have to do because of sort of the division of powers. Um, and broadly, what is coming out of this discussion around indigenous communities and indigenous ind people living in urban environments is sort of these big questions about what treaty rights, right, accrue to bands at a collective level to sort of have reserve land, to have community resources, whatever that is, and which of those accrue to an individual? Is the responsibility for, is the requirement for education? Does that mean that you have to build a school in indigenous and reserved communities? Okay, because if it does, that leads you to a certain set of actions that are important. But it's also possible to interpret that and to say that that treaty right to education accrues to individual indigenous people i.e. if you are Indigenous you have this right to get an education and the federal government is responsible for that. There's all kinds of questions about well what does an education mean? Does an education include only grade 12? Does it include your high, does it include higher education? If it does how much of it you're supposed to pay for? All of those sorts of questions are really really important um, and by and large when the treaties were written especially the numbered treaties 
the idea was that those rights accrued to bands, but there was also, like, the world is also different in 1876 than it is today in terms of uh, the signing of some of those treaties. So indigenous people in cities is a really interesting and very challenging aspect um, of sort of understanding indigenous communities and indigenous people in Canada today, partially because um, these are more than half of Canada's indigenous population that exists outside of the infrastructure that was designed to provide services to that group of Canadians. Um, so in many ways, the reality doesn't match um, the system that was set up to deal with it. And we haven't really changed that system in a very long time. 